G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Draw with Jazza. I'm Jazza and today I'm doing a video tutorial on how to create comic book style line work and shading. This is a process called inking where essentially you're given a drawing, a rough drawing, something like this, and then you apply inks. Now traditionally when comic books were made on traditional pen and paper, that would be someone's actual job is they would use ink pens and ink in the whole process. Now this has led evolutionarily for that style to carry on even through digital artwork. So I'm going to be using Photoshop today and creating digital lines and shading around my sketch of Thor here. Now I'm going to be doing the inking for this piece in several different stages just to help break down some of the different techniques and tools that can be used because you don't have to necessarily apply all of them at once like line shading and cross hatching and solid outlines and all things like that. You can actually just use elements of it in your artwork, but I'm gonna try and demonstrate them each one by one today and apply them all to this image. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is doing my general line work. Now I like to use custom Photoshop brushes and I'm currently developing my own set, but I have my own ink brush that I like to use that I'll be using for my drawing today. And as you can see, it's got a lot of pressure sensitivity and a really nice solid edge. So to cut to the chase, I'm gonna bring down the sketch work for this image just slightly. And on a new layer above, I'm gonna use my brush for inking just to draw in the features. I'll make sure the brush is the, the size that I'm happy with and I'll go with 15 for now. And I'm just gonna go through and do my inking. Now, what I'm working with here is something called pressure sensitivity where I'm using a Wacom tablet and a pen and the harder I press the thicker the line becomes and the thinner I press or the more pressure I loose off of the the pen tablet surface thingy uh, the lighter it becomes and this is really useful because it's nice to have strokes that rather than looking like this end up looking like this if that makes any sense. So to have some dynamic elements to your brushwork. And I really like to make areas that are covered in shadow a bit thicker. So for example, the top of the nose might be generally slightly lighter and the bottom of the nose be a bit thicker until it gets a bit thinner up at the top here again. And that's a nice little tool to use and keep in mind when doing line work of characters. Um, and also just to make sure that things around the edges are usually a bit thicker as well so that the outlines of the characters are nice and solid. Um, areas that overlap other areas. So for example, where the beard here overlaps the mouth can be a bit thicker. And then we have the rest under here can be a bit thinner then back to the outline and things like that. So you get the, the idea and it's a bit of an improvisation process. You'll find you can allude to texture as you draw your main line work. So for example, on the face, the skin is fairly smooth, but in some areas that have some indentation, such as the cheeks and the pockets of the eyes, you can use a few little sharp fine lines just to indicate that there's a ridge, but not necessarily a solid overlap. You can also indicate texture at the edge of hair, such as the beard, where I've just done a few little tufts sticking out. And of course, the gradient from the skin to the beard texture, just by showing those little lines, which again indicates not a solid difference between the two, but sort of a transition between them. Another thing I love to do when drawing hair, especially in long flowing locks like this, is just to use some fine lines in between some of the really thick solid strands of hair, just to show that there's a little bit of texture in there as well. By having texture, Texture in some areas such as the hair and parts of the skin and then not so much texture in other areas such as the cape or the torso we show the difference between these surface areas and the textures on those materials and also give the eye some interest and variance in what it's looking at so it's not too busy everywhere One of the fortunate things about doing digital artwork is the fact that you can undo and redo and use layers. And one of the ways that we can utilize this is when drawing really long lines for elements of an image such as Thor's hammer, you can overextend your arm in the stroke and draw a line longer than the entire width or length of the line so that the middle portion of the line that you end up using is nice and clean and straight. And then you can quite simply go in and remove the edges of the line that are a bit softer or wobblier. This hits the best of both worlds because using a ruler or a solid line tool can look a little stale, but trying to freehand the entire length of a long line can be really difficult. Thank you. 
So I've gotten my core line work to a place that I'm happy with it. When I say core line work, I mean the general shapes and outlines of the character without going into shading or detail or texture or anything like that. We have done some minimal texture just through how we've used the line in itself. So for example, if I hide my construction work, you can see it is a lot more simple looking, um, but at least nice and clean. But if I zoom in here, you can see that there are some texture happening through the outlines in areas of the face and of course the hair we have some of these thin lines as textures and things like that but the general piece is actually fairly void of detail so now I'm gonna add some detail and I'm not going to use the same brush so the brush I've been using at the moment is what I call Jazz's ink brush and this is my go-to for inking and it's this really nice sort of uh, thicky thin sort of sharp texture but now I'm gonna start using my fine liners and I have as part of my brush set ranging from a 0 0.1 0 0.2 3 five and then a 1.0, 2.0 and 5.0. And now I've tried with each of these brushes to mimic the size and the texture uh, and the shape of these actual brushes. So this is what the 0.1 and 0.2 look like, a 0.5 obviously being a bit thicker than these. And then finally, when we get up to the 1.0 and the 2.0 and the 5.0, things get monumentally thicker, but there isn't a lot of shape dynamics. I'm actually pressing really thin and then pressing really heavy. And there is some element of control there, but I've kept it pretty minimal because the reality is when you're using fine liners, there isn't a huge amount of size and shape when it comes to thickness of the pens you're using because you're using one of a specific thickness. Now, the reason I'm going into all of this is because I'm actually going to use several different fine liners. And I'm gonna start off with more of the broad ones. So if I start off with a one 1.0 fine liner, you can see that it is fairly thin, especially when compared to the rest of the character's line work, but it is a lot thicker than let's say the 0.2 or the 0.1, which I will probably end up using for cross shading and hatching and other fine textures. So I've got my 1.0 fine liner selected and now I can go through my piece and start adding some detail. Now, where do you add detail? It's tricky because normally I'd be inclined to do things like this, but that is actually adding some shading and we're gonna do that separately a bit later. So really, I just wanna outline the areas that I do want to add some lines to for detail. There will be some areas of the beard to add some texture, but not too much. And of course, if you have these random little hairline spike things in the middle of the hair too much, it starts to look a bit odd. But just adding a few little points of detail to places like the mustache. In general, we don't need to do too much because a lot of the work will be done through the shading and this character doesn't have a huge amount of texture variance. But there are of course places like this grid pattern on the arm where I can bring back up my reference file and follow my basic lines. An easy way to do this without following those construction lines that I set up is to create a middle line and follow the geometry just to make sure that we're keeping that 3D feel and it's following the flow of the arm. And then to add another line between that middle point and the edge to act as a middle point between those two areas. And then we kind of do the same thing. We follow the depth of the texture. And by doing this line by line, we're slowly adding a bit of a 3D effect to his arm. Once we've drawn all the lines flowing in one unified direction, we draw another line in the opposite direction and follow the same process, drawing a midpoint, then a midpoint to a midpoint and so on and so forth. You can see that the end result of this process is a really cool 3D looking grid-like pattern. So I've done my layer of detail now and you can see if I hide this and show my original layer and then go back and add my detail, there's not a huge area of detail that's covered. There are specific areas that have a lot more, for example, the arms and then bits of the face, but then the rest of the, the image is actually mostly the same. But just by having concentrated areas of detail, we can already alter the look of the image quite drastically and it makes it look much more comic book-esque rather than TV cartoon. The other thing, of course, to note is that the line thickness being quite a bit thinner and without the 
uh, weight variation that the rest of the image has sets this detail apart from the line work that I've already created and makes it uh, a lot softer on the eye while adding a lot to the image. Now the next things I'm going to talk about are line shading, cross hatching and then solid shadows and these things all can work together quite well and can be used in isolation. So to demonstrate my line shading and cross hatching I'm going to select a different fine liner and I want to find one that is of a thickness that works well with the image and I think I might go with a 0.2 and as you can see that is still quite thin the 0.1 is extremely thin and probably a little too fine for this image because we have pretty thick lines overall so far so I'm just going to select my 0.2 fine liner and I'm actually going to follow the same direction and start adding some line shadows now one way you can think about line shadows is essentially you're identifying areas that are not being hit by the light source that we have. So first you need to actually identify a light source before you start drawing too many shadows. Now I just started off by doing this area with some lines uh, underneath the eye and that's mostly covered in shadow so that was a bit of a safe bet. But to actually identify where all of the shadows in the face should be, an exercise that you can do to help make this an easier process process is just on another layer to throw in a solid color something like this a neutral sort of tone it doesn't actually matter what color but just something that is easy to set apart from the line of work um, but also isn't too obnoxious and just to actually add in this shadow just a solid shadow area and the reason we're doing this is because it's going to really help us identify exactly where all of our line shading should go so the light source in the direction in this image is sort of like this it's coming down from the top so it's hitting the top of the cheekbone the top of the nose the side of the beard and the top of the mustache maybe a bit of bit of shadow is covering the top of that mustache because of the nose but we're essentially coloring in all the areas that aren't being hit by that light now this is simply for the purposes of demonstrating how you might identify where to draw your line shading but you can quite simply if you have another layer to follow draw lines all in one direction filling in only those areas What you have at the end of this as a result of drawing lines only in that area is, if you hide it, what looks like a shadow area. So you can see that this color area that I sort of drew in was a helpful little tool to help identify exactly where to put that line shading. But as you might imagine, to do that every time you have line shading and to do that everywhere where the line shading is present will become tedious and a little bit frustrating. So over time you start to develop a bit of a feel as to where the line shadows turn up and where they don't. So for example, I won't shade in this hair here because it's all quite in the open, whereas this hair at the bottom and underneath here looks like it's actually sort of uh, flipped upside down and covered by the rest of the hair and also further in the background. So that is a helpful little tool for me. So I'm just going to shade in that whole area of hair back here. Now you may be wondering why I'm doing all the lines in general in the same sort of direction. There's no real rule for this or there's no solid answer. Really it's because for this image and for Thor as a character I'm going to do something a little more uniform and a little neat looking because you know he's you know a, a god and a king and all that stuff. So it sort of complements the style of the character in general but there are other forms of line shading that can work really well in in different styles and one of them is to draw line shadows that vary drastically with every sort of area of that line shading and that helps to create a really chaotic sporadic look which can be really useful and cool as well. Another thing to note too is that the line shadows can act as a bit of a gradient so sometimes a solid line will end but the line shading can actually continue on and show that there is still an indentation in the surface area of whatever you're shading in there. In some areas or objects of an image that are less important or more in the background, you can actually shade the entire thing with line shading and this can sort of help push it into the background and make it less distracting in the image overall and also help aid a sense of depth in your image. Something you can do to help make this process easier as well is drawing a few straight lines and holding shift to make sure that they are exactly straight in Photoshop and after cropping the ends and stretching them out you can actually 
put them on the correct angle and copy and paste them and use these as the lines in your image for areas that are a bit larger and would be really difficult to do line shading freehand. Then once you've finished placing in the lines of the area of difficult shading, simply outline the area that you want the line shading to only appear in, inverse the selection and delete everything outside of it. The result is then a very crisp and solid line shading area that looks more in the background of the image. So I finished my line shading layer and if I hide my line shading to show the, uh, the simple detail and line work underneath, you can see that that alone is a huge difference. Now another technique of shading essentially is the same thing with one simple addition. We add another set of lines going in the opposite direction and this is called cross hatching and it's a little bit more of a, a dirty look but the good thing about it too is we can use them both together to create a better sense of depth. With only one set of line directions for our line shadings we're pretty limited but with our cross hatching we can actually add areas that are a bit deeper and darker than just the simple lines going in the one direction on their own. The other thing too is we can create a bit of a simple gradiented effect. So for example, we have this level of shading here and by cross hatching about half that height all the way along, we get a bit of a sense of depth in this section of shading. And you can actually go in some of the areas that are just a little bit deeper in their indentation and add more lines in the opposite direction, adding some cross hatching effect. You can also do the same in areas like the face, for example, here in this area behind the nose, that would be a little deeper as well. And then of course the area immediately under the lip, but not um, below and onto the chin and so on and so forth until we get a look that we're happy with. Now, of course, with all these larger areas of line shading, if you want to add cross hatching, you don't necessarily have to go through and manually do it. We can do the same thing that we did when we sort of cheated and did our line shading there. We're doing a very large area, so don't worry too much about all that overlap because the next thing that we do is select a lasso tool and outline the areas that we want to have the cross hatching in place with. Now that I've done that, you can see my original line shading all going in one direction. And then when I bring up my cross hatching, you can see that that does add quite a bit of depth and also some level of gradient in areas of our shading. It also adds a little bit of grit to our image without being too overt and helps direct the viewer's eye in a way that isn't too uncomfortable. Now, the last thing we're gonna go through is solid shading. And this is one of the most iconic styles of shading for comic book these days and can be really cutting edge and cool looking. Now, essentially we've almost already touched on this in a way when I did that example of filling in the solid areas with that color to show where I put my line shading, we're essentially doing that but with solid black color. Now, the thing to remember about this style of shading is it can be pretty scary and uh, we sort of need to jump outside of our comfort zone and just put the solid black shadow where the shadow would be. Because the reality is after putting a lot of care and effort into our detail in our image, we might feel a little bit restrained like we're losing some of that. And the reality is we sort of are, but when we're brave and we throw in the shadows where the light won't be hitting, the end result can be a really cool dramatic effect. So I'm just using my original ink brush pen to do this and there will be some areas that will be a little larger that I'll need some painting in and filling in areas rather than just drawing with uh, a brush pen. But we'll get to that when we get to that. 
Now there are some areas obviously that have some detail that needs to remain there such as defining shapes that sit on top of each other but both are cast in shadow. And if you shade solid black on both you will lose certain shapes. So something that you can actually do to maintain the integrity of the silhouettes and shapes that you draw is simply leaving a very fine white line between those two solid shaded areas. The result is then two areas that are solidly shaded but that are also so identified one from the other and we get a cool sort of backlit effect as if it has some rim lighting. So I'm really happy with how the solid shadings come along so far and I'm nearly done but these last few areas that I have to do are pretty broad and to sort of fill them in by hand is going to be really time consuming and frustrating. So what I can actually do is outline the areas of my solid shading with a pen, maybe even a fine liner so I can differentiate them and just sort of outline where the shadow will be contained and then simply use a selection tool, make sure to expand the edge by one or two pixels and then you can fill it in. The result of all of that then is a piece which looks quite a bit different to my cross hatching and line shading pieces in that it has a lot of solidity and not so much gradient in the way that we've done the shading but either can be used in isolation to a really cool effect or they can of course be used together. So if I bring back my cross hatching layer, you can see that they actually merge together really well. Now I have today for the purposes of demonstrating all of this done them separately, but normally if I was to do solid shading and line shading and cross hatching, I would do the solid shading first and then I would work the line shading and cross hatching out from that solid shading to help create the gradients and accentuate that effect and of course to save yourself from repetitive strain injury which it can be really difficult to uh, avoid when you're doing so much line work. So that is the result of our tutorial today. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video tutorial on creating comic book style line shading and solid shadows and all of that. Make sure to check out the link in the description to get the reference files. You can get this Photoshop files and some PDF and images um, on the stages of creation for this image so you can explore it for yourself and see how I did this example and of course you can explore uh, in your own time and do it yourself and hopefully you'll have a bit of fun with that. I hope you enjoy the result of this and uh, are looking forward to when these brushes come out. Thank you so much for joining ladies and gentlemen and until next time I'll see you later. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video subscribe to my channel to see new content every week. Check out more of my stuff by clicking the annotations over there. If you want to support my work and get a few goodies for yourself head over to my store for archives, ebooks and get yourself something nice. If you're looking for a great place to collaborate, explore, or share your own content, head over to newgrounds.com. That's it for now, and until next time, see you later.